It really, it really is great to see the, the room so busy this evening. It's fantastic. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, just a few words of welcome and a few, bit, a few points of housekeeping before I, I hand you over for your, the real reason that you're here tonight. So the first one is that um, we are going to record the presentation this evening. Uh, I don't know if the speaker actually knows that, but <laughs> but we are going to record. So, um, And again, that's for all your colleagues who possibly haven't been able to make it tonight but are genuinely interested in the topic. So always we say, please smile, because not only do we record the, the speaker, but we take some shots of the, the audience as well. And if you wouldn't mind, please put your phones on silent. There's nothing worse than somebody's really embarrassing ringtone coming out in the middle of the, of the session. Thank you. We don't envisage there being a, an emergency this evening, but if there is, the exits are at both ends. Oh, the door in the, is hidden in the corner. I'm, I apologize for that. The emergency exits are at either end, and we escape to the front of the build, building out onto Sheikh Zayed Road. Um, if you need a different kind of an emergency, the toilets, they're located back out um, opposite the elevators where I'm sure you came up to come to the event this evening. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you. My name is Craig Garrett. I'm the manager of this academy that you're using the space of this evening. And this is really what this space was designed for, is for events like this. So we're delighted that you could use this and take this opportunity to make use of this space. And my colleague Arun, who, who does the IT magic behind the, the desk there, also manages the academy with, me, with myself. We're based here 100% of our time. And Arun will be the one who will be recording the event as we go. Yeah. Um, just a little bit about the Academy. This is our sort of mission statement. Partner with industry as a catalyst for thought, leadership and knowledge exchange. Of course, you're the industry that we're engaging with. So we're, it's perfect that you're actually here. And our big thing is knowledge exchange and that's exactly again why you're here tonight and I think that's why it just fits perfectly with what we are trying to do here that um, you, we have one side of the industry looking to um, educate the other side of the industry with their knowledge and their experience so thank you very much for being perfectly aligned um, with what we are trying to achieve here. We have seven academies globally. You've seen our spaces that we have here, and, we pr and they're all available free of charge. And we have a set of standard courses that we deliver. If anyone is interested in any other information to do with the academy um, this evening, then please feel free to ask us, but that's not why you're here. Just wanted to say a couple of things. The first one is that there is going to be some catering. So please do not leave without helping us eat this catering that's going to come. Otherwise, a very few people are going to have to eat a lot of food. So please remember, don't leave without helping yourselves to the catering. There is also some registration pages are being circulated. So if you've came in late and you haven't seen that, we're just trying to record everyone that's here. We know that some of you have re uh, registered online but we know that there also might be a few people um, who haven't. A um, little bit of a plug from my Bentley colleagues who have asked me to mention that, of course, we're here tonight to, to, to hear from VSL, and we're delighted that such a, an industry leader in, in that field should be here, and they want me to unashamedly plug the RAM concept Bentley product because that is something that's used that, you, that is associated with the product. And again, if you, if you want more information on that, please see myself or some of our Bentley colleagues. And it leaves me just to hand over, first of all, not to the speaker for this evening, but, this, but first and foremost to the, the current chairman for the iStruck, T. Sama. Would you like to come up and introduce tonight's event? Thank you. all for on behalf of instructional engineers i can see 
number of uh, new faces which we generally not see. So how, mon how many of you know instead of structural engineers are connected already? How many of you already connected with instead of structural engineers? Oh, so many numbers are new, so it's very good. So it's a great opportunity for us to introduce yourself or as an institution to you. So today, uh, first of all, I thank you very much for Mr. Craig to arranging this platform for us to, to introduce us as an institution as well as uh, today's topic, which is VSL. So today's topic is Mr. Anand. He's Mr. Our speaker is Mr. Anand. He is a technical director of VSL. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's from Technical University from France. And he is instrumental in developing technologies. What is a uh, cable stay technology, correct? I'm new to the cable stay bridges. From a lot of people from Middle East, we are very new to cable stay, basically. And he's very active in uh, FIB and PTI. Uh, I'm requesting Mr. Anand to take over theirs. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for all of you being there. I'm a bit impressed, so you can applaud me if I eat my words. Uh, we're going to talk tonight about uh, state cables and uh, development of state cables and uh, state cable design, design making use of state cable. And of course, you may have a lot of questions. And uh, please, at that time, if you wish, can you ask directly right now the question on the spot so that we can have a bit of interaction? into this uh, speech, and this will help me to progress in my, in my, in my speech. Uh, I will go shortly as an introduction uh, presenting the VSL company very quickly in terms of offer, and then of course talk about stay cable. Uh, first, in the point of view of components, what is a, a components of stay cable, and then a, a bit of a word on the development, because lately stay cable technology have evolved uh, pushed by the market, pushed by the needs, the desire of owners, of architects to make it uh, better. So this is what we're going to go through. A uh, few slides. So this is uh, uh, the big, big group company, and VSL is, is there. A very small company at the bottom, but very innovative. This is why we are here today. Uh, a bit of history. Uh, VSL has been built as a spin-off from Losinger. So Losinger is a Swiss company, which was uh, known worldwide at that time for construction. And VSL, meaning a four-span system Losinger, has been created around a patent of how to anchor uh, wires uh, to an anchor head and transfer this force to a piece of concrete, basically. We call it post-tensioning, eventually. And VSL has been developing the uh, wedge for this seven wire strand. And from this concept, have developed uh, post tensioning, stay cable, heavy lifting, and other application making use of, of strand and anchor head. Hi, welcome. And uh, this started in uh, 1960, and then uh, till now we have uh, developed and uh, broadened our offer to uh, many solutions, application technologies, and so on. So in few numbers, uh, VSL is around uh, 4,000 people uh, all over the world and uh, managing patent as any uh, innovative company uh, defending their developments uh, where we can find VSL on Earth. Um, basically, VSL works on uh, various technologies, uh, bridge construction, foundation, ground engineering, containment structure, repair. In terms of technology, we're talking about of uh, post tensioning, classical core business, uh, bearings, stay cable, of course, which is the topic of tonight, heavy lifting and geotechnical. Bridge construction, um, so this is something we have been uh, uh, aware in uh, here in this region, bridge construction, we have been uh, quite active there. Uh, foundation, that's far from all. I'll go quickly on uh, all this. Uh, you can you talk me if you need more detail on some of these aspects? containment structures, and of course, uh, 
last but not least, uh, repair and uh, retrofit, which is uh, the new challenge of tomorrow, uh, maintaining a huge park of uh, existing structures. And this over the uh, last past 60 years, many references in uh, many different fields, and a lot of them is uh, about bridge construction. So let's now enter into the, the heart of the topic, uh, stake cable. And um, just a bit again of history about stake cable. Uh, first stake cable bridge, 1978, and then since then we have keeping developing and uh, eventually uh, with various solutions till now. So here we are. Uh, in terms of stake cable, um, we're going to look at it uh, from the point of view of components for the beginning. Say cable, everyone knows what it is. It's a cable structure transferring force from one point to the other. Uh, today, in the perspective of a new recommendation and new code, it's seen as a, a family, five families of components. The first one is an tensile element. Uh, this strand, which is transferring the load from one point to the other, Second, the anchoring, the anchorage, transferring the force from this one strand uh, to the structure. Yes, please. Just I take opportunity to, uh, to remind you, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to uh, raise your hand. Uh, I'll be happy to, to answer. So, we're talking about, about strand first. The main, we call it the main tensile element. Uh, this name, you can see it in the recommendation. Uh, international recommendation, you can see it as well in a, a design standard and codes like Eurocode tensile element. And then we have the termination. The termination is a word used in Eurocode. It means the anchorage. It's the component transferring the load from the strand to the structure. Then we have the cable encapsulation, classically the stay pipe, and all the families of components associated to the stay pipe. What is this cable encapsulation? It's the interface between the cable and the environment. It is what the, the cable sees from the wind, from the dust, from everything coming from outside, including UV and so on. Then we have the protection of the cable at deck level. Quite important is where the cable is an interface with the user. It's where the user can touch the cable, can impact on the cable itself. And eventually we have what we call transition device or deviation device. Is this cable, stay cable, this particularity is it to be exposed to wind, to environment, and therefore it will uh, be subject, subjected to uh, wind forces, wind loading, making deviations transverse loading, and therefore we have to accommodate this uh, and cater for these uh, deviations. So we have devices. So this is how we're going to structure that speech. If you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand again. Actually, yes. Can you please. elaborate a little bit on the vibration boxes? Absolutely. I will do it in a few slides. It's a good question. No, oh, sorry. It's okay? This is okay? You have this in mind? So now in terms of application. Uh, Today, and especially in the perspective of the FIB code, um, systems have to be modular, meaning that you can have a technology of strand, a technology of, say, of anchorage, and apply it on various different applications. And this offers some design opportunities. Basically, we have a cable. We have five, four different family of applications. We have stay cable bridge, long span structures, long cables, we have what we call extra dose bridge, where the quantity of live load compared to the permanent load is much smaller, permitting some optimization into the behavior of the structure. Then we have hangers, roof cable, vertical. Then we have to the other extremity of the application range, what we call uh, bow string cables or uh, tie downs. And uh, all these different cable application, we can give a bit of classification. I just change the slide. And this classification is made from the point of view of uh, the loading. Whether this loading is inducing is a high fatigue loading 
or where there is more uh, deviation or combined. And from this loading, what type of permanent force we accept to have on this cable. Or let's say it differently, what part of the capacity of the cable we accept to have as a permanent force and what other part is left to cater for safety. So if we go with state cable, we have high fatigue loading, high deviation potential occurring, and therefore we do not occupy more than 50% of the capacity for the permanent load, basically. If we go with this hose cable, we have a moderate fatigue loading, we have low deviation, and therefore we can go beyond in terms of, uh, in terms of permanent force. Hangers, these depend on the application. We can have hangers experiencing no fatigue loading, and others with high fatigue loading. And therefore, this is a decision of design. What is the maximum force we can have in permanent situation? Bowstring cable, usually you have very low fatigue, almost no fatigue, no deviation. Tie-downs, you have low fatigue, but you can have extremely high deviation. Um, what's the acronym for GUTS? You've got 50% GUTS. Ah, good question. GUTS is... Uh, means guaranteed ultimate tensile strength is basically your cable capacity. Your cable is failing 100% GOTS. 50% uh, GOTS means that you have reached uh, half of the capacity of the cable, basically. Is this the initial load you put on the cable when you construct, like, or is the final capacity? No, you can only stress till 50%, like, when you put it, like. This value usually is the one you have, what we call it, uh, at maximum service state. Uh, it's a maximum service load, meaning that you, if you anticipate to have on your cable a high service load, for your permanent situation, you would stress it initially at 30%, for example. Yeah. So finishing with uh, tie-downs. Tie-downs are cables which are used to restrain a deck of a bridge against the abutment. And uh, most of the bridge, they elongate with temperature variation. And therefore, this cable can experience very big rotations. So then you have to judge as a designer what would be the maximum uh, force in this cable in service upon the potential deviation you may have on the side -ons. So from this classification, um, VSL as a state cable supplier company is offering a portfolio of solutions. And uh, what is important with this various type of solutions for each application is that they can be combined together. Typically, tensile element, we have various technology of strand. And these have to address uh, the situation of the structure, basically, the exposure to environment, how harsh is the environment or not, the type of loading you, ex you expect, and uh, very important, the, the, the normative frame in the area, the design codes, Typically, in the USA, it's not allowed to have galvanization on the strand on federal projects, and therefore you have uh, codes developed for the use of this type of strand without zinc. For the part of the world, you can use zinc, so it makes the technology a bit different. Why? Why, sorry. <laughs> why in the US we have no zinc? No, why Americans are not allowing galvanization? Um, <laughs> you want to which answer on this one? <laughs> I think it's uh, galvanization is a technology which is extremely polluting. One reason is, is not all of them, is that galvanization process is highly polluting. Polluting, polluting correct. Polluting. But it's not un only this reason. But today, what I know for sure, is they are developing a, a code, a design, or a normative to have zinc into the US as well. But for the uh, moment... Uh, the heat changing the performance of material? This is true. Uh, but it doesn't mean it doesn't work. When you have a material and you apply a zinc process, you change the characteristic. This is true. And therefore, we have different uh, requirements for strength with and without zinc. This is very true. Correct. 
and especially if you have uh, silicium in your steel, and then you have a bigger impact on the zinc. Yeah, you're going to have quicker. Exactly. Talking about transfer component for transferring the load from the strand to the structure. Same, we can apply various different solution. Solution with anchor heads, solution with clevises, and solution without any anchor, just by deviation. We introduce the load to the structure through a deviation of the cable, we call it a saddle. The encapsulation of the cable, the stay pipe, has to accommodate the environment, which can be of various form. So it's here to provide to the cable a satisfactory behavior in terms of wind uh, impact. The wind impact is of two nature, the drag first, which is a force that the wind is introducing onto the structure, making it tilting. This is one aspect, the other aspect is dynamic. How the wind is exiting the cable is one aspect of this. Then you can have effect, uh, other effects of the climate. Snow, for example, you can see it uh, later. And of course, the cable is the biggest part of the structure, which is, uh, can be seen by users, and therefore it can be uh, uh, a subject to uh, architectural features. Let's call it uh, LED, and then we can see how LED impacts a cable in terms of design, for example. Then we have protection, various type of protection, basic protection, fire protection, blast protection, all of these being required or not, depending on the structure. And eventually we finish with uh, the deviation device, which can be dampers, which can be guiding device, which can be just nothing, uh, just a compact, compacting element to maintain this uh, compact shape of a cable. So we go one by one on all this family. Let's start with the main tensile element and coming back to your questions. Today the standard is this um, um, strand, uh, I don't know if it works, um, which grade is 1860 MPA. This is a new standard which has uh, evolved from the former 1770. Today, uh, the strand industry has developed into a higher grade, 2160. So the industry of uh, wire is keeping, increasing the capacity of strand. And today, of course, VSL is proud to have been fully qualified for this application. Is there any reduction? You mean, can yeah. I, can yeah. I turn your question into, is there any loss in ductility? No, I didn't ask that. I said extension. extension. You mean elastic extension? Yeah, because that you have got a certain extension upon which you should not allow any further for the ultimate. Yeah? So the, the young levels is the same. Relaxation? No, so no, extension, not relaxation. So if you, if you apply a higher grade of strand, you have a higher, you can reach a higher extension, this is true. Whether you have a loss in ductility, whether you fail with a higher extension, today we, there are strand suppliers capable of reaching a very decent extension within the same limit of the extension we observe as a requirement for the 1860. But I, I don't know if I understand well your question is whether we have lost in, we have a more brittle material or not. Yeah. It's not the case, but it's not either the same chemistry on this trend. There is, there is a small jump between 1770 compared to 1860 to 2160. And there is a change in the chemistry of this material permitting to have similar ductility compared to the 1860. And this is approved by the international code? This trend is a new development. No, so whether the code is ready to absorb it, to accept it, no, no. Not, not everywhere, no. not everywhere. So today, the way to approve that use of strand is to make sure that a system exists which can accept it and still comply in terms of performance with the code. So this is what we have done. So we have taken that strand we have modified the anchoring system to accept that strain. And then we have done testing and passed successfully the level of performance required as for a classical system. 
for state cable. But if the next question is, can we optimize a structure by this use of strand? The response is technically, yes. Economically, not sure. I have to explain you why, because the cost per newton of force is higher with that technology of strand. I told you it's a different compared to uh, that technology of strand. So unless you have a clear technical reason that you need to go more compact, then, then it might not be optimum, this use of high grade strand. How much more expensive, 20%, 100%? No, it's not this, it's not this. Uh, we're talking about few percent. But this depends on, the, if you analyze the global cost in your structure, and if you try to introduce into your cost all other parameters, if for the same quantity of strand you have higher force, you can reduce the number of strand, and maybe you save into labor costs, you save in many other places, but trying to save only on the pure kilogram of material is a waste of time. So this is a strand, we call it PTI strand, which is uh, the strand as it is uh, recommended or, uh, in the US, which has no uh, zinc, and therefore has slightly better <coughs> behavior sometimes, and slightly lower for other aspects. Talking about uh, fracking, for example, is a bit less. Talking about ductility is a bit better due to the nose on the strand. VSL is making use for a specific uh, concept, I will show later, strand without any sheathing and injection. And eventually, we're talking about epoxy coated strand. Uh, VSL has reference experience with this type of strand, but VSL does not recommend the use of that strand. <coughs> and do you have a cost code strand for state? We, we have experience that we will never recommend this technology of strand. Maybe we can discuss this. Why we do not recommend this? Does it crack? Why? Sorry? It, it crack. Yes, it's it's correct. It's getting it very cracked. famous on internal strands, but then it you, seems have of, you have a lot of wedge loss, etc. right? You have a, a huge setting of wedge, yeah. and you have a huge increase in relaxation. Yeah. Today, we are relying on this strand. Why? Because it has a very low relaxation. And now we introduce technology which is multiplying by more than two the relaxation. And on top of this, you, um, we have a test, and this trend has low redundancy, meaning that you do not lose one wire, you lose a complete section. Yeah. It's a low cost corrosion. Exactly. So you don't recommend just for the state cables or for uh, a post engineering? Yeah. VSL position, I would say, is to. Um, to to do the best for the structure, and today we have not seen any advantage of using uh, epoxy coated strand in any application. Uh, maybe we have overlooked something, maybe uh, we have missed a point somewhere, but for the moment, we do not see a technical interest in going with that strand for the moment. Uh, talking about anchoring components or elements. So this is basically the standard uh, um, state-of-the-art technology of anchoring a cable to a structure. Two types of anchorage, uh, one called the dead end, passive end, uh, fixed end, depending on the vocabulary you want to use, and the other called stressing end or line end. Basically, you attach a cable with these two anchorage and you stress by the active one. You can stress by the passive one if you wish, but you cannot tune the force with the passive one. You tune the force by the active one. And where yes, I have been developing lately is to introduce all these uh, components you have here on the, um, I don't know if this works, you have here on the, yes, on this part here, we call it the transition zone of the anchorage. For the passive anchorage, they are integrated into the anchor head. The anchor head is a head, this piece of steel, where you have the wedge transferring the force of each new strand to the anchor head. So we have all these parts here, which are, sorry again, yeah, which are here in this transition zone, are introduced, introduced and uh, concentrated inside this anchor block. This is kept for the active side, for one reason, is because from this side you have to stress or tune the force of the cable. So there you don't know where it stops the shading of the strand. 
and the shitty operation has to stop inside the anchor block. So we have an extension which is required to make sure that we absorb this position of the shading stopping inside the anchor head but to make sure the system remains tight uh, during service and during installation. Do you have any question on this? So this uh, anchoring system can be uh, implemented into a structure and there are a lot of different possibilities to do so. It can, at the bottom, for example, it can go inside a, uh, a box girder, below a box girder, above the deck, through a steel structure. It can attach a tower through steel structures or through the tower or inside the tower. Everything is modular in there. It's, uh, it's about design uh, possibilities, how, how to connect it. And, uh, is there a minimum space required for if it is inside the box girder for your jack? Here, for example. Yeah, the first trick. Here or here, absolutely for the jack. Yes. How about like, is it VSL proprietary jack for the system? Correct. So, what is the minimum space? Yeah. So we can tell you it's one meter behind the head, for example. But then we can dis negotiate a bit on this one. For this one, we can work with much more smaller space on the passive side. On the active side, we can as well reduce the space. It's a, it's a detailing exercise. We just have to make sure we can do the operation which we are supposed to do, and from there we define what would be the minimum requirement space. Are, using, a good question. are using single strand jacks? Absolutely, yes. Sequences become really a headache, yes? Not necessarily. How many cables, you, strands you have got in one cable? We go from uh, 12 to, uh, or seven or three to, uh, 180 something seven. It's a repetitive exercise. It requires a bit of uh, concentration. And how long would it take to uh, put the forces in one of those big number anchors? Depending on the same cable, because you have to thread the strand through, erect the strand, <coughs> connect the strand, thread the strand. No, just pulling it. Just pulling it, it depends on the length. Jacking. Jacking it is a, uh, jacking itself on its own is uh, 30 seconds. But, but then you have all the process behind threading the strand through. No, 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 it was, it was just checking because you said you have got 170 or 180 strands. Yes. So each strand 30 seconds. Yes. Well, only for stressing. Only for stressing. Yeah, I know. That's where the stressing it's, comes at the end of the installation. I know, I know, but then that you have followed what's the sequence. So you have to install the strand from top to bottom and stress it and then move on to the next making sure they are not entangled in between. So here is an example of application of this type of technology of cable. And you can see cables ranging from, uh, let's say, 50 meter to 400 meter long. So uh, bear in mind, 400 meter long, to array the strand is a bit of time as well. So when you have a 100 strand unit 400 meter long, it takes a bit of time. We're talking about two days, two days and a half. It depends. But then coming back on this system, and increasing the force again, then you just multiply the 30 seconds by the number of strength. And you add it up by having something like 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours. Just out of question, you eventually have to give the bridge to somebody. Yes. And is it going to be a level submission or force submission? You are checking the forces that the bridge should be at a certain level, at a certain time, certain Correct. temperature. This, this, this is a... Uh, Let's call it a discussion with the designer, what is relevant as parameter. What is very important is that a state cable is like a, is like a structural element. As a designer, we cannot ask a state cable to be at the same time at that force and that elongation. Because they depend between each other based on how the structure behaves. Either you call for the force, you want that exact force, and then consequently you get this elongation as a consequence of how the structure has behaved. No, I was talking was. about the deck. The deck, typically. Because the deck should be horizontal at a certain time. Exactly, the deck should be at a given position. Let's call it the road design line. But then if you ask for a force to be there, based on your model as a designer, and this force is such as after stressing the deck is a bit above or a bit below, this is not, it's not the consequence of uh, the cable itself, it's the whole structure behaving. And what happens most of the time, especially in composite bridge, is that the stiffness of the deck 
Can I just say something here? Yes, please. Because most of the people here are building designers. Okay. And they say, this is up to the contractor to do it. They don't know the bridge designers go through that to come up with all the balancing force, go through the sequences. That's what I want you to say, because most of the people here are building designers. How many bridge, bridge, bridge designers here? Yeah, so you understand that <laughs> part, yes? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. No, it's true. A deck is a very flexible structure, and the geometry is given a lot by the stake cable themselves, but by the, the support force you have. And, uh, and tuning the deck geometry goes through tuning the cable legs. And of course, uh, it's more convenient to call for the force from the designer, give me the force, but then you lose on the geometry. So better to go for a geometry, and then let's check the forces within tolerance and within where we want to be. It's a better way of proceeding. Yep, correct. We are, we are okay on that part of it. So I'll just make a... This is a, a development that PSN has started like 15 years ago or 20 years ago. We call it the dehumidified system. We depart completely from the requirement we have today or the recommendation which calls for having strength with a wax injection, sheeting, a lot of petrol-based material inside. And we replace this passive corrosion protection into an active corrosion protection. How it works is the stay cable system or the steel maintenance of element, including the anchor head, they are in a fully tight encapsulation. And the air inside this encapsulation is a dry, is a dehumidified. The water is removed from that air. This technology is today well spread into uh, protecting corrosion, the deck structure, for example, or box girders in steel. And it works extremely efficiently for, for cables. Today we have a catenary cable of suspended bridge making use of this similar type of technology for corrosion protection. And uh, VSL has patented this solution, and today we will try this solution, quite disruptive, which is far away from recommendation, into a project in Hong Kong. Why Hong Kong is because it's uh, very humid and hot, so very aggressive for corrosion, and therefore we have the best um, field situation for testing the technology. Uh, the advantage of this technology is because we have removed all this material, we can make the state cable much more compact, and we can combine this together with an existing dehumidification plant working for the deck, for example as a box girder. So is it a continuous process, new modification, or it's like turn at some intervals periodically? Uh, if you see that graphic here, uh, this is basically the, the, sorry, the corrosion rates according to humidity. And what you find out is with a relative humidity of 60%, and below you have almost no corrosion. It picks up quickly fast, very fast afterwards, but below 60%, uh, no corrosion happens. And all uh, the humidification plants usually they work at 40%. So the idea basically is to have a closed loop of dehumidification. This is a principle applied in this Hong Kong project, for example. So you have a, you keep retreating the same air, and your machine is just here to gather for leakage. But as soon as you have leakage, you have to refeed with dry air, so you dry only the piece of air you add on top in this circuit. And you come at the end of the day, if your system is perfectly tight, the machine works for the first two weeks, and then finished. If your system has leakage, you keep a little bit. But we are very far, far away from, uh, in terms of uh, consumption, electrical consumption, we are far away from the manufacturing process of the strength itself with the shading and the, the works and so on. So there you have a global uh, optimization, especially in terms of uh, energy. And, uh, and today it's quite fashionable to talk about uh, energy saving. So if we move on on uh, other technology of say cable, clevises, uh, I think there is a project in Dubai making use of this type of uh, solution 
where it, VSL has been developing is to have a Clevis state cable system which has similar type of uh, performance as a heavy duty state cable system. Not to, uh, not to uh, uh, reduce the capability of the system by having a Clevis. So the testing regime of this solution is similar to uh, the other one, which is FIB and FIB30. So there we have, again, uh, a passive end, uh, the active end, and the force is tuned by threading of this rod into this socket by use of a jacking system. The system is uh, for heavy duty application. We're talking about uh, a small number of strands, so let's say light stay cable, but in terms of uh, fatigue loading, the objective is to reach the same capacity of the conventional system with uh, this classical two million cycle test and megapascal reservation and so on, and dynamic uh, deviation of the cable. Coming with uh, stressing equipment and of course uh, application, main, mostly on arches. This is where we have most reference for this type of, uh, of technology or uh, roof cable, for example. The important is same, is since we are using exactly the same technology of termination with wedge and seven wire strand sheeted, you can make much of it. You can apply, for example, a clevis together with an anchor head. You can, you can uh, interchange components. It's modular. You can, for example, if I come back here, attach on top a clevis and at the bottom having a stressing head like this. Roof application. Now we talk about saddle. Saddle system uh, has been a, an extremely successful development of VSL. Saddle is the original historical way of connecting a cable to a, a tower. I'm talking about 100 years from now. And this has disappeared because uh, all the, the negative, the drawbacks of this technology, when we deviate a cable with force and the f cable is looking at fatigue loading, you have extremely rapid damage of the cable in the saddle. And so this has disappeared of many recommendations and codes, talking about Germany, for example, or in the US, where in Germany, saddle has been completely banned for, for a period of time. It come back to the picture, thanks to this type of development where we, companies like VSL have achieved to develop a saddle which does not compromise the fatigue performance and uh, which is giving some solution for the classical uh, problems of this technology. How this works? First of all, it works by having an injection inside the cavity. And second, and this is the beauty of the system, we have experience with wedges. Let's apply, let's apply this wedge concept uh, all along the saddle. So the strand, instead of sitting in front of a, of a round or cavity, with uh, only one unique point of reaction. It sits on the cavity which has a shape which is providing two points of reaction. And we amplify artificially like this the friction and uh, hopefully we do it without uh, jeopardizing the, the interface and without creating a uh, fretting corrosion. And of course uh, we have a main application of saddles is a uh, Exodus Bridge, and it's been quite successful in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Just uh, one reference I'd like to mention about saddles. Uh, this is uh, one application in uh, San Francisco, seismic area, and uh, there are designers uh, crazy enough or interested enough to apply saddles in a seismic area, a friction saddle, and uh, how they did it is uh, thanks to this uh, injection of material inside the hole. This material here uh, has a viscosity. So the combination of a dry friction plus viscosity permitted to, uh, to have a nice uh, control of uh, movement during a, a service type of uh, earthquake in uh, San Francisco. I suppose you know which cable is going to which hole and you do it one yes. at a time. Correct. Which is strand, I mean. 
each strand is parallel, each strand is stressed one by one, and each strand goes from a one anchorage in a defined hole through the saddle in a defined hole. You to probably the other jack them from the bottom to the top, yes. We jack the strand uh, on two sides. No, I'm, I mean, you have got How you fit in the a cable, I've got many strands. Correct. You start jacking the lowest one first, yes? Or not? No. So what will happen the, if you put, it's going to crush the other ones? Or what? No. Or the the matrix, matrix, the matrix of the matrix. You mean in uh, the straight line, it's OK. This matrix is designed to hold the force of the other strand while the other hole are empty. So it doesn't matter which order you Correct. Have. You can uh, even empty hole. But it's a very good point to say, because after installation, due to the fact that I saw first the top one and then the second the one on the bottom, we have to come back and reabsorb, readjust the force on all the strands to absorb some uh, setting of the matrix itself. So it's possible it holds the force, but you have to reabsorb by restressing a bit the top one at the very end. To, uh, to absorb the, the vexation that has occurred inside the saddle. Do you use the same technology for external pulse tension in continuous uh, structures as no. mediators? Talking about, no, not that one. Okay. We have different type of technology for this. Thank you. Any other question? So, this saw has been used on this uh, Odariat Stake Hill project, second penang in, uh, in Malaysia, and uh, uh, East Europe, Poland, India, a lot of application as well. Um, here is a nice application where we have been using saw with a 169 strand, so it's uh, one of the biggest <coughs> cables we have installed is with saw actually. This is to say that uh, the size has no impact on the performance. You can upscale this technology with how many strands you want. It's, uh, it's quite modular. Few slides about links. This is an alternative to saddle, where instead of having a continuous cable from one side to the other through the tower, we uh, connect it through a steel structure uh, in the tower. Uh, it's a design telling you the size to have a correct behavior between the steel member and the concrete tower. Requires a bit of a touchy detail there, but uh, this is an alternative which can work. Some aspect has to be uh, looked at in terms of durability, and especially at the exit part of, the, of this link. Talking about link, it's an element which is designed to code and not tested, basically. But then we have to uh, consider the right loading on this link and of course, if you want to have a, a redundancy in your design, this element, and this is uh, mentioned, for example, into your Eurocode uh, 3111, has to be designed to uh, support the load of, uh, the breaking load of the cable, and not necessarily the actual load on the cable. Why? Because uh, if you want to have enough room for uh, ductility, the failure has to happen on the cable and never on this element, which has a very small reserve of ductility due to the the size. So these are projects where Link has been installed. Yeah. Some references, mainly in India and some in Europe. Uh, words about transition device, uh, dampers or guides. Uh, guide deviator uh, are usually required uh, to control that your stake cable with a deformation you're gonna have during service will not touch the structure, basically. In terms of uh, deviation control, it's not a necessary component for VSL anchorage. But it's very important in case your deviation can go quite far due to whatever effect, service effect, to protect any contact from the cable to the structure. Talking about vibration. <laughs> Sorry for the sound. Thank you. So vibration, this is a, so, These are type of vibration which are meant to be uh, addressed by use of dampers. Uh, we call it a wind vibration. 
So this is an example. Uh, this is what we call uh, the Meikunishi. Uh, the first time we have uh, we have uh, experienced um, radiant wind vibration back into the 1980s. Um, not every cable technology are subjected to this type of vibration. The reason of this high amplitude vibration is because this technology of cable, which is a PWS, they have a very, very small intrinsic damping. So any energy introduced by the wind to the cable is kept there inside. While the tech strand technology of cable, we have an independent strand. They can have each strand an independent movement, creating internal shocks, internal friction. And this is dissipating energy. And therefore, they are not subject to this type of vibration. But still, for long cable, um, solutions are required. And uh, solutions, they are basically either internal <coughs> dampers or external dampers. DSL is promoting the use of a friction or rubber damper. They have the disadvantage of being nonlinear, so difficult to calculate in terms of performance. Friction is not linear and rubber as well. However, uh, these dampers have very good performance, a great performance. There is a technical reason behind, is because they introduce perturbation into the model behavior, and therefore you disseminate the energy in one month into several modes, which can be directly damped by the cable itself in form of intrinsic damping. And this makes this damper extremely efficient. And they are compact, and a very important point is that a damper is dissipating energy, meaning it transforms mechanical energy into heat to one component, and this component uh, is wearing with time. And no chance, a damper contains wearing components that have to be maintained. And the idea of these dampers is to have this component as small as possible and as easy to change as possible, basically. Design life. A damper is meant to control vibration. The vibration is affecting the design life of the cable. Why? Because it's, it damages the uh, components here for corrosion protection. I'm talking about the sheeting, the ceilings, all the specific components that are very sensitive to vibration. So by making use of dampers, you increase the design life of your state cable. This is a, a one solution to manage the design life of the state cable. Sorry? Yes, except that uh, the strand itself, I mean, if you come back to this, uh, to this, sli to this slide here, uh, when you look at what type of damages you have on a stake cable because of vibration, it's more or less corrosion protection. Today, we have uh, only very few examples of wire failure due to vibration. There is an example in the US, uh, Sabo Bridge, maybe you know that name, where uh, the, the, the cable failed due to vibration, but it's not the, it's not the wire, it's the connecting part of the cable. Uh, a wire that are very strong in terms of uh, vibration loading, but every component you add on to the wire for corrosion protection, these ones are very vulnerable uh, with vibration. But yes, you're right, seven bridge, cable has been replaced uh, losing wires due to vibration. So, so the bridge deck uh, dampers can be uh, installed for different uh, shock absorber. You mean? Yes, correct. Here we're talking about uh, dampers for cable. So typically, like this, uh, you can see it here. Uh, you have the cable. Here, uh, the cable is moving, the damper is at the interface between the fixed part of the, the deck and the cable itself, and dissipate this uh, relative movement energy through dissipation. It's a different technology compared to the deck damper. Yes. And basically, uh, how you assess uh, the performance of the damper <coughs> on the cable is by doing a test and you measure uh, the log deck of the cable, log deck being uh, how the damper is reducing the vibration per cycle, and you measure how much uh, two consecutive cycles has a difference in terms of amplitude, and from there you derive the performance of the damper. So uh, there is a bit of uh, 
analysis behind to anticipate the performance of it. And uh, this type of analysis, of course, uh, VSL as a DevOps supplier can support you as designers to define this. It depends on the frequency of the uh, uh, cable itself. Yes, absolutely. As absolutely, it depends on the frequency. Um, here is uh, typically, uh, just to show you this, for the same state cable, it's various technology are damper tested. And these are various modes, for example. And as you can see, the frequency can depend upon the mode. And, um, and every technology of dampers doesn't behave the same way with the frequency. <coughs> some dampers will provide performance independent from the frequency and some others independent from the amplitude. And this depends on the type of, uh, of uh, function or behavior your dissipative component has. But there we can have a deeper discussion on this, if you wish. Usually for ZIP2, we use a tuned mass damper. This is a certain mass is connected to the structure through a spring, which is Correct. absorbs the kinetic energy. Correct. This tuned mass damper has been tried for state cable. But the big difference there is that a state cable <laughs> can, have a, can be sensitive to many different modes of vibration. And a tuned mass damper, you tune it for a specific type of frequency, and therefore you are losing the other performance for the other modes. So what is very important for state cable is to have a damper which can work with similar efficiency for various different modes of vibration. <coughs> I've seen them being tied together. You know, if these are cables going that way, they're tying it that way. Is yes. that efficient as well? Cross ties, you mean? Yes. Yes, cross ties are extremely efficient <coughs> for that vibration. The first time I saw it, we started doing it that way. Yes, extremely efficient except that uh, it creates a lot of durability issue. Yeah, you have to keep looking at it. And uh, installation issue as well. And when you have to get there. Exactly. And cross tie to uh, manage durability, they have to be tensioned a bit. As you tension, you cross ties, you jeopardize the geometry of your state cable. Yes. So whether you want to, uh, to invest in all these drawbacks just to get the benefit of the vibration, control that you can get with this damper is a different question. So basically, the response is yes, cross is extremely efficient, but it has a lot of drawbacks. We can propose this, provide this cross ties on demand, but this requires a, a real assessment in terms of design life of the structure, because the drawbacks are significant. For specific application, we can have external dampers which is basically applying the same concept of a dissipative element, but to a structure attached uh, outside of the cable itself. And this is uh, another technology of dampers making use of a uh, uh, rubber material. <coughs> um, let's talk about cable free lengths uh, and corrosion protection. Today, uh, most recommendation um, <coughs> Required to have a, a several multiple layer of corrosion protection, and we are talking about a two nested barrier, and the interstice between these two barriers is filled with a hydrophobic medium. So this is a typical FIB concept, where the two barriers are here the PE coating, here the zinc, and in between you have um, this uh, wax or this uh, grease, whatever uh, um, hydrophobic medium. Um, VSL is promoting as well, as we said, the uh, active uh, system for current protection, which is making use of dry air, where we have an external barrier, which is a state pipe itself, <coughs> because it's tight. We have a zinc inside it, and in between you have a dry air, which is a hydrophobic medium as well. Uh, but this uh, raises up the question of the durability of this uh, state pipe. It's, if it's part of the Corrosion protection concept, therefore, it has to be uh, the performance of the stay pipe has to be assessed in terms of durability. This component is plastic, HDPE. We know plastic are uh, degrading with uh, UV and, uh, and light, and therefore, there are tests to be performed to qualify this. And just to keep in mind that many colors are available, not all these colors survive the same type of uh, solar exposure we have a much higher better performance for the white, gray, black compared to the red. 
a red steel pipe in Dubai will not stay red for a long time. This has to be uh, kept in mind of designers to make sure that the right color is chosen. A stay pipe uh, primary function is to protect uh, the stay cable and secondly to make the stay cable having uh, satisfactory dynamic behavior uh, according to wind. And again, what it means, it means have a, a lower drag coefficient and, other, and making the stay cable unsensitive to uh, this uh, uh, galloping phenomena or vibration phenomena. So this has to be assessed through uh, wind wall testing. And this type of test has required regularly to assess uh, this performance. Today, we are making use of uh, RIP technology to, uh, to achieve this, but there is a uh, various technology of RIPs. Another issue which is picking up uh, lately is the ice. It's not hopefully an issue here in Dubai, but uh, on some countries, it's extremely uh, uh, <coughs> dramatic as an issue. Um, um, Ice is today creating on state pipe during a cold period, and when the, the temperature is raising up again, it falls in big piece and really introduces severe damages. And this is the latest big track field of development. First, to understand how this ice uh, accrete on the state cable, and second, what solution can be implemented to avoid this ice to fall down. It's just an example of uh, requiring uh, university research, and we have PhD ongoing on this matter, exactly on this matter. Heat it up. Sorry? Heat it up. Make a big radiator. <laughs> Global warming, you know about it? <laughs> exactly. So these are solutions we have in developing. Heating is one of these. Uh, we have others, and uh, this is what we investigate today. We have, we are very proud to, uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, the lab test and one solution which has been proven in lab actually to be working extremely well. We can go in detail on this uh, one day. Um, LEDs, uh, this concept uh, picked up here in Dubai a long time ago for a project which is not yet here. Uh, it's in, from the engineering point of view a very nice challenge. Basically, it's uh, questionable. I think it's a matter of uh, architects. But in terms of design, um, it's a fantastic challenge. Introducing a light onto a state pipe and expecting this light to be in the same position after five years and shooting in the same direction because this is what is part of the architectural design is a challenge. And we are very happy to have uh, taken this challenge and uh, find a solution for this addressing either the installation, the replacement of the LED, and of course, uh, ensuring an LED positioning all along the lifespan of the state cable. Sure, yeah. So uh, we have had uh, the first mock-up here in Dubai for a couple of time. A uh, few words about cable protection. We're talking about uh, protecting these area here <laughs> where users can access. Uh, Defining um, a protection for the state cable go through a risk assessment. It depends upon the design first, whether this design has enough redundancy to accept damage on the state cable, and upon some uh, risk related to the use of the structure. And uh, to help designer or owner to make this risk assessment, we have developed uh, this uh, different protection level uh, grading, rating, where P0 basically is uh, when you have no protection only for uh, environmental impacts, uh, rain, wind, dust, and so on. P1 is what you're going to find on most of the bridge is an uh, unintentional uh, uh, e effect of a user on the cable, anti vandalism environmental impact. P2 is typically for a bridge which is missing a bit in terms of design of uh, redundancy, and therefore we have to make sure that an accident happening there will not jeopardize the bridge itself, or in a place on a structure which, has, uh, which is a bit strategic in a sense that uh, it cannot afford to be closed for a period of time for replacement or repair. And P3 is for a strategic infrastructure uh, located in a geopolitically unstable area, 
uh, like uh, US, for example. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, these are. Uh, yes, heavy protection, blast protection, and so on. Talking about fire protection, this type of event can happen. So we have many examples of, uh, of uh, events where, um, where a truck can catch fire. We're talking about a hydrocarbon fire, 110, um, 1,100 degree. The duration of the, the fire depends upon the, the situation of the structure, whether it's far away or close to a to a firefighter uh, facility and so on. And from there, we develop fire protection. These fire protection that are here to provide to the cable itself, the maintenance element, sufficiently low temperature so that it can hold the force. And this is uh, assessed by test. Uh, test today, they are mandatory according to PTI. Uh, they are coming onto the picture in FIB again. And uh, there are various type of freighting or fire protection mostly depending on the, the time, the duration of fire. The temperature of fire itself is, under the, uh, is 1,100 degree, basically. But what the logic of the design technical statement is for the case that one mistake is not there? Is Correct. So uh, we, we call it redundancy. The bridge should stand even if it loses one cable. Yes, correct. <laughs> Today, at least if we follow your code, as a design document, we should have redundancy of one cable. Yes. And, uh, and some of the code is even more, and some is less. But then, from there, we, we take a decision on whether the design has already accommodated for a, a fire risk or not. And if not, we can uh, reduce the consequence of that risk by having a protection. It's a risk assessment approach, which involves design and, and component itself. Basically. So this is an example of uh, a bridge making use of fire protection uh, and blast protection. One slide about blast protection, ultimately. Um, um, BSL is developing one solution, uh, capitalizing on the fact that as part of design, uh, a state cable uh, is under permanent situation is stressed to 50% of GOTS, meaning 50% of the cable capacity is redundant if they're just for safety. And the idea of this concept is to make use of this 50% additional strands to protect the core one inside in case of blast, basically. And how we do this? By having an equal protection for each strand and the outer strand are deflecting whatever load, blast load, and provide protection for the core one inside, making the blast protection extremely compact and, uh, and lighter a bit. So now we have been to almost all these components. If you have any questions, um, don't hesitate. Uh, shall I go on state cable development? Um, R&D, uh, I had a, a feedback earlier today about uh, state cable uh, technology as having evolved extremely quickly uh, lately. State cable is still a, a domain of uh, steel engineering where there is a lot of development today. And um, the R&D can be made either in-house, as VSL is doing, and as well with universities in partnership with a designer as well. And, um, and latest development are this LED and ICE uh, issue. Uh, we have not been talking about this installing state cable, same as post tensioning. It's a, it's a technical work and requires a bit of training. And today, uh, this training <coughs> is not systematically given into universities. It's the role of each uh, specialist contractor to train their staff into installing state cable. The performance of a state cable, and this is something quite important, does not only depend upon the quality of its component. It depends as well on how on site this component has been assembled and uh, installed. And uh, VSL has developed a, um, an academy where there is a, a mock-up 
where these installation methods and uh, tools and equipment can be, can be commissioned, where staff can be trained uh, before going to a site where they have to perform for the very first time. Do you think you can train the staff for other companies? It's a good question. The response is yes. We are willing to offer this. Uh, for a contractual scheme where uh, the cable is installed by another party, yes, the intention is to uh, offer that these uh, workers are trained into our academy for our companies. Yes. What will happen to guarantees <coughs> if somebody else installs it? Uh, if it's, this is a, a very classical contractual discussion, and this is why it's very important to have uh, the labor installing the state cable or the post tensioning system trained into our facility. And uh, for sure, uh, this is going to solve many you issues. To anybody else, you will install it. <laughs> yes, it's a good point from my colleague. Uh, in every situation, uh, we are supervising the installation on site, always. Um, <coughs> stay cable uh, uh, <coughs> testing and uh, development qualification. Um, today, um, just uh, I'm going a bit fast here, but I come back afterwards. Uh, there is no such thing as <coughs> approval for state cable. And there is a reason behind. It's a very fast evolving market. The technology is changing quite uh, rapidly. And therefore, there is no international body capable of uh, uh, locking today an approval type of, uh, of a qualification. And therefore, we are working with uh, recommendation documents. And these recommendations are for designers, for you, to ask the right questions to people like costs in terms of uh, performance for a state cable system. Um, today, the two documents which are used worldwide are the PTI, mainly coming from the US, and the FIB coming from Europe. And they are providing guidance on what type of testing should be required for what type of application. And these documents are the base for, uh, for us as a state cable supplier to achieve are designed by the right qualification testing. So today we have a, likely a new release of uh, the PTI last year and uh, as well a new release of the FIB last year, which is an achievement from a long uh, whole work from uh, the FIB committee. We have as well now another document is a code, it's a Euro, Euro code and uh, the Euro code is in process of being reviewed as well and the next new thing that's going to occur on this Eurocode now is that the appendix related to testing will be become normative. Meaning today is just an informative appendix on the Eurocode for testing is becoming soon normative. It means that uh, it's a must to have uh, this system uh, tested. So what type of test are we talking about? We're talking about a fatigue test where we are aiming to uh, confirm the actual fatigue performance and the bending fatigue performance. This is a uh, new commerce into the uh, FIB89. And this is to address a uh, ULS situation, design, ULS design situation. For SLS situation, we have a, a test to qualify the serviceability of the system, which is a litmus test. We make sure that uh, the system uh, is offering a suitable uh, service performance and for solar efficient test. But it's not everything. We have as well qualification of uh, stay pipe or encapsulation, which go through uh, wind tunnel testing of two types, uh, drag coefficient and, uh, and uh, dynamic behavior. And uh, basically, we have as well, on top of this, tests for the deviation device, dampers. These tests are mainly done on field, and they are here to, um, to prove uh, our assumptions on damper requirement and design. A few words about installation.
quickly. Uh, Stay Cable, the way they are developed and promoting uh, these companies, uh, strand by strand systems which are stress trend by strand, and maybe you can come back to your question about uh, smooth installation. And basically it consists in two uh, erecting first uh, a stay pipe with one strand inside, and from this stay pipe in place, threading one by one each other those strand, and stressing them using uh, an equipment. Hopefully this equipment is a bit uh, modern by having automatic record of information so on for a more smoother relationship with the designer in terms of exchange of information. Does that have anything to do with grain as well? You're talking about the stay pipe. Yes, correct. These ribs, they are here to cater for a phenomena of vibration. We call it rain and wind. But not only, and especially lately, based upon the last PhDs uh, performed in front on the CSCB, they found out that uh, the biggest positive impact of the rib is for the dry galloping. And the theory of the rain and wind can be questioned again. Whether we're talking about a surface a texture or whether we're talking really about a rain rivulet. Yes, correct. But this can be uh, summarized into a dynamic behavior. So this is why I call it dynamic behavior with the wind or wind interaction, dynamic interaction with the wind. Yes, it's a good point. So here, uh, installation of stay cable with saddles. Um, with, with saddles, uh, two cables are installed uh, simultaneously, the one on the left and the one on the right, because the strand itself, the maintenance element, is going through the tower. It's one piece of strand, anchor of one anchorage to the other going through the tower. And uh, of course, this is the type of equipment you have on site for installation. The important point is that it's not heavy equipment, and uh, this is why this technology of indoor strand cable has picked up in front of other technologies like PWS. It's because we are manipulating low weight equipment and uh, components. We're not here to manipulate uh, the 25 tons cable, we're just manipulating a coil of two tons, and with this one, eventually, we're going to make uh, uh, almost 100 tons take cable. Uh, last but not least, uh, monitoring, maintenance, repair, uh, what happens during the service life of a state cable and a state cable bridge. Uh, monitoring is quite fashionable. We have to manage the service life of a structure. A state cable is a very good prop to understand the behavior of a state cable bridge. Knowing the force of a state cable gives you a lot of information on the bridge itself. itself. And um, these structures are highly exposed to environment and therefore that requires a bit of monitoring. So we're talking about uh, uh, on-site measurements, data manipulation, treatment, and uh, interpretation analysis. So all this process uh, has to be implemented. Um, maintenance of state cable system today uh, one information about uh, new technology, and especially this one from VSL, is that they are designed to be maintenance-free. This is a opposite to a log coil system, which requires, by design, a regular maintenance. This type of cable requires no maintenance for 100 years, let's say. However, this information, this design is based upon information we have today. And a big part of what happened on state cable is uh, unpredictable or unpredicted, and therefore inspection is uh, required and is a must. And uh, another way of saying things is that a maintenance program is established for state cable based upon finding from inspection. And from finding from inspection, you understand what would be a particular span of particular components of the state cable, and therefore you can tune your design plan. So when approaching a project with stay cable system, according to the state of the art technology, we have to bear in mind that the final maintenance plan is developed along the life, service life of the cable itself, based upon finding from inspection. How can the support of the cable be visually inspected at this higher level? 
Um, on this bridge, for example, we have an access. About the periodic, periodic uh, inspection. Yes. You, you have two locations in your state cable which we, we, where you can have uh, effects, where you can tune and understand how it behaves with age. It's near the anchorage. This is either here or here on top. So, so you have an easy access here at this anchorage. This is reachable, but what about the top? In the tower, you can reach the anchorage is inside the tower. Usually these towers they are built like uh, with a void inside, with a core inside, <coughs> you climb up, and from there you, you access to the, to the anchorage. And then, uh, if you want to have an ID of what happens outside of the tower to the cable, either, and this happens, we go with climbers, or you check what happened at the bottom there, which is uh, more loaded. And if you find out that you have no issue here at this location, you can deduct that maybe there is no much issue on top as well. The risk that you have an issue on top is lower. If now you start to have recurrent issues at this location, maybe you want to invest into a, having a more deeper investigation of what happened on the top. So you, you, can, you can adjust your uh, inspection program according to your findings. Usually, this tower is reachable at uh, some point from the tower? From the inside? Yes. Yes. It depends on the tower design. It depends on the tower design. Yeah, correct. <coughs> is there any approach to, uh, to uh, monitor this, this detail using cameras or whatever? There, there is with some of the, some of the modern uh, repair and uh, monitoring things where the drone technology and things is now improving to an extent that you can get much better access using drones to fly up and do camera inspection externally. That, that's developing uh, with time and the improvement of the current technology, so which is a lot easier than, as Rashid said, the older method, which was you sent climbers up. Because I feel this point is not always reachable. Sometimes this tower is solid, not yes. from Correct, if you have a Sabo, for example. If you have Sabo, the tower is solid. So you have some design where there is already some uh, lifting device attached to the tower. I'm having in mind, for example, uh, Wadi Leban in uh, Saudi, where you have a lift directly there attached to the tower for inspection, for future inspection. And you have project where nothing has been considered. And then, of course, when you arrive on this spot, on this project, uh, where nothing has been considered, you have to establish or to organize an access on top which can be difficult or easy depending on the situation. Yeah. It's a good point. It's a good point in the sense that in a phase of design, uh, access for inspection, sometimes they are forgotten and they are very important. And uh, a design permitting inspection, and providing access, uh, it's a lot of uh, headache glass for the future. Yeah. So uh, force monitoring or other type of monitoring can happen. We have two technologies for force monitoring, load cells. Uh, we have as well the two different type of load cells, uh, magnetic load cells, uh, resistance load cell, and we have a behavior assessment. Let's call it vibration assessment methods for force monitoring, which can be extremely accurate, extremely accurate. As a, for information, small story, uh, Queen's Ferry Crossing, one of the biggest AQL projects in uh, Europe. Uh, the designer has considered the vibration assessment of force as the most uh, reliable one for his project. And uh, has finally tuned the bridge according to information received from a uh, vibration force measurement. Repair and retrofit, um, very important. This is a type of incident that can occur on the state cable. Uh, here is an example taken from uh, from Ting Chao Minyang in uh, in China, where a barge basically, uh, after a storm, detached from uh, from the harbor and hit the state cable bridge, and it hit it by the crane through the cable themselves, which was a very nice and interesting exercise of how to uh, to uh, to test <coughs> state cable replacement by uh, occupying the smallest part of the of the bridge deck. And uh, it was a nice training for VSO. Um, 
behavior of the whole structure. Um, here, uh, VSL kind of uh, offer um, capabilities in uh, health monitoring, uh, assessment of health of the structure uh, based upon measurement of data from uh, sensors. And um, here we go as a conclusion about inspection. Few references, maybe. Uh, this is the end of uh, my uh, speech. Sorry for having been so long. Just a few bridge pictures. Um, Queens Ferry Crossing, Mersey Gateway, um, Saddle Project. So these are state cable with uh, saddles. Um, hangers, uh, roof stadium. Um, Exodus Bridge, uh, various type, mainly using saddles. Uh, state cable bridge, making use of saddles and uh, link possibly, which uh, bring us to uh, this conclusion. Um, about state cable, um, what is important is um, it's one of the most dynamic uh, field in civil engineering where we still have development, very interesting development where we have still PhD university running on. It's an interesting topic. Uh, what has made VSL being a leader in that matter is uh, by performing the R&D themselves and uh, by, provo by proposing and offering a range of uh, components, modular and a wide portfolio of different solutions for various applications. And uh, voila. So this is it. Sorry again. The wind coming from down. From down? Yeah. When that is in wind on the bridge down, can this cable go The deck is responding to the wind, wind coming from. Uh, from down the bridge. Yes. Yeah, from the, uh, so, uh, so, from the point of view of the state cable supplier. Uh, so, the coming can be from the floor and it's. Yes. So what we, we call it a paramedic station is when the, the, the wind or the traffic is affecting the deck behavior and this is exciting the state cable itself. The next question is how the tension is the, uh, the bridge deck is very lightweight. Yes. If the wind is more, it will have tension. So the bridge deck is more <coughs> Yeah. I, the the, the static part of the wind force is, is marginal. What is important is, uh, is how dynamically this deck is behaving exposed to that wind. And maybe the deck is vibrating because of the wind. And maybe this movement of the deck is <coughs> introducing vibration to the state cable. And this starts to be quite critical because this is a, one of the most severe causes of vibration on, on cable, what we call parametric, is when the vibration of the cable is induced by a movement of the deck itself. And this happens when the, the cable frequency and the mode of the cable are close to the one of the structure itself, especially the deck. But the static force of the wind itself is not significant in terms of loading compared to the uh, to the other loading we have on the structure. How much initial pretension requirements? I mean, um, um, you have to pre-stress first, and remaining reserve for the SDLs and uh, live loads. So initial pretensioning, how much you recommend for that? Um, it's a good question. Uh, today, we wish not to not to to force designer to have an initial pretension. Meaning that if we are facing a state cable where the pretension is very low, ourselves as a state cable installer will artificially organize an interface between the wedge, the strand, and the anchor in a way that this has no impact on the performance. So to make things easy, if you have 30% of guards as tension, it's perfect. It's quite fast, quite easy to manipulate. If you go much below, if you have only 10%, 5%, if you have 10%, or 20%, we're going to apply what we call power seeding. We're going to power seed the wedge to avoid any issue linked to the fact that tension is low. If you go even below this, talking about a few one ton per strand, or even less, then we'll power lock the wedge. That means we're going to lock the wedge to a higher force to make sure that nothing can happen, even though you lose tension into the, the cable itself. So. Depending on the situation, we adapt ourselves, our method of uh, implementing the force on the cable to make sure that uh, we have a satisfactory mechanical performance, even though the tension is very low. 
But bear in mind this cable, they are working very well with high tension. This is why cable are good. They like high tension. High tension means uh, good behavior. So do not hesitate to optimize your cable cross-section to maintain the tension present at the subpatient level. Unless you have a service requirement of flexibility, otherwise, uh, let's go optimum. In one of your slides, you mentioned uh, guys, like guaranteed ultimate tensile strength. Yes. Yes. Why so low? Generally, in building this, you up to 75% maximum. It's a good question. Um, usually, on uh, post tensioning, we go to 70 80%. 70% generally, in building this, yes, building. correct. Yeah, this is correct on post tensioning because in buildings, this because the tension because the post tensioning system in buildings has no fatigue loading, mm -hmm. almost zero fatigue loading, and no deviation. You put the kill at the position. You pour the concrete uh, you, uh, on, on, your, uh, on your slab, then uh, when the concrete is squared, you, you want to introduce the tension, and then the force will be the same, and the duty will be the same, and then it's finished. This take cable, we have the force changing with time, and this will introduce fatigue. And therefore, we need to have some reserve of capacity to cater for this uh, fatigue loading. And this is the reason why we reduce uh, the tension. So maybe it's too pessimistic here, or too conservative approach, the 50%. And this is today under discussion to this recommendation document. But this is one reason. There is another reason, is the relaxation. Uh, we, one of the aim uh, in using the strand is to have no relaxation. The strand is a very deep product, the seven way of strand, because it has very limited relaxation. But we guarantee this very, very small relaxation when the force is not that high. And 50% guarantees you that you don't need to bother with relaxation at all. On the cable itself, not on the <coughs> structure, but just at least on the cable itself. I remember there was an equation called Ernst equation Yeah. for the actual stiffness mm, of, yes. the, of the cable. E equals to... Yeah, because e the cable length and other things changes it. Uh, I think uh, this equation is related to the sag of the cable. Yes, yes correct. Yeah, let's call it uh, the second order, second order uh, effect. Yeah. Uh, you have to allow for that. Yes, this is correct. We don't go, don't think it is P A over L. The stiffness. Yes, correct. Uh, but this is uh, depends upon the geometry. So if you do the calculation with the software, make sure that your software has a secondary order calculation modules inside, and then you can just ignore you know, the Ernst equation. My software was hand <laughs> calculation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you have your hand to calculate, just don't remember. <laughs> don't forget the, the question is true. Yeah, one question. During construction, yeah. uh, you stress, the stress is stayed, then another one, another one, and then your previous stays obviously undertake more force. Yep. So during construction, how much do you recommend to not exceed what the guts? Um, this information is provided into a FIB document. There are information about it. Uh, usually, what is applied is uh, uh, even if on the permanent you go like 50, yeah. and during construction you can go to 85 if required, right? Or, or 80, or as long as you control the elongation, etc. In, in the FIB, the value of 60% is mentioned as a maximum during construction. But uh, I, I don't think you would go much higher because during construction, all the support repos dead load are not there. You do not have all the parapet and so on, so, and you don't have the maximum light load. 50% guards is the maximum service. Yeah. Meaning that under permanent situation, you should have maximum 40. And the reconstruction usually is recommended not to hit 60%. While for, we know for individual strands, and especially the first one, sometimes we can go up to 70. But uh, this is allowed, assuming the force is not there for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's temporary. And only uh, one or two strands, not more. That's correct. But can this allowance be used uh, in the extreme cases? Like during your construction, you happen to have an earthquake. So your force is like, you have like 10 stays in the design, but you are only four actuators. But then this stays going to take much more higher forces. Like the, in those cases, can you go up to 70 or 80? Like, do you have any? Testing done for it, or do you have any research done for it? 
But what you know is we do a tensile test. Yeah, for sure. And uh, tensile test, you have to prove 95-98% uh, of GOTs. And, uh, um, uh, sorry, 92% of IUTS, which is the actual force on your allural capacity on your cable, 95 of GOTs. And this, we know, we know the cable can handle this. So it's just a redundancy, it's just a safety. Whether you're gonna fail with your cable because of a stressing at 60, 70, I'm not sure, but you have to respect sufficient safety rule. But uh, we can always discuss on, uh, on this detail how much force you want to have per strand or in the cable during construction. And last question. Last question. I had seen 2000 catalog for 2000, this strange system. At that time, you were allowing 45%. So in 20 years, you have done good technology research. So we have jumped from 45 to 50%, which will help structure engineer. In that catalog, we had a stress variation around 200 MPa under full tension and less tension. So now, how much we can allow the stress variation in a strain? You say making use of uh, which strain? Uh, the, the 1860 or the 20? 1860. 1860. Um, it, it's, it's a good question. I try to find the, the good answer for you. Yeah, like, because I remember, <laughs> like, uh, I was fortunate to work on Mumbai Pune, like, uh, yeah. uh, this uh, Mumbai extra dose bridge, uh, like, cable supported bridge, which had a span of 250 meter, designed yes. by HNTB. At that time, we were using 200 MPa stress variation and 45%. Yeah. It was sometime 0.42. 2000, yeah, 0 0.42. 0 0.42, not 0 0.45. 0 0.4. Point, point four two yeah, is coming from the lock, from the German Dean standard. Yeah, but I'm just saying point four two. We were looking at. So today, uh, the the FIB says you can have fifty percent maximum service, and to make use of this fifty percent maximum service, that means that the state cable has undergone a test at forty five percent and two hundred MPa tuning cycle. Two hundred MPa and tuning cycle. Yes, correct. This is for stake cable application. If you go extra dose, you can go higher than 50%, you can go to 60% maximum service, meaning that your system has undergone a test at 55 maximum, 140 MPa two minute cycles. But this is the equivalent, what we call the characteristic fatigue loading. What you have to do as a designer is to uh, uh, estimate the characteristic stress variation based upon the your bridge response, uh, which is not an easy exercise, we call it the pandem minor summation of damages, where you compute this equivalent uh, stress variation. But today the limit is 200. Then if I go a step beyond your question is uh, what happened with higher stress variation. So we have made one test one day in VSL, and we have made a test with 250 MPa stress variation, 10 million cycles, and we passed it. So whether this 200 MPa tuna cycle is a limit, the response is no. It's not it's a limit. Psychological limit. <laughs> it's, it's, just a, it's just a position where designers believe they have enough room for design. And if they feel they don't have enough room, we can go beyond, but then we have to qualify this. But we have had a test with uh, uh, 10 million cycles, 250 MPa on the strand system. 619 in, uh, in Vienna, positive test, two. And now there is one question about this super high grade strand. So if you seek as a designer for optimization because you make use of this uh, 2160 MPa grade strand, uh, you have an optimum for your ULS verification, you are happy, what happens with the fatigue? If you reduce the cross section, what's gonna happen with the stress variation at the end? So of course we have to apply a different rule. If we, today with the 1860 we have 200, and you seek for optimization by making use of 2160, maybe you would like to have a 250 MPa stress variation, and then you can have an equivalent optimization. Just imagine you have a problem with your PI, you cannot get it anywhere. So that's that's very <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kamen. <laughs>
it's a great presentation for all of us as majority of all of, majority of us are from building industry it's a interesting for me particularly durability aspects of the cable so we are looking forward to see a, a project in future which is if it is anything is happening in going to be in here and uh, thank you very much again and thank you to vsl for arranging a dinner also today <laughs> and uh, again thank you very much for bentley bentley systems for arranging a nice venue thank you thank you just two two quick things before you go would you believe this room was cold earlier and we were worried now with a hundred people in it i think we're <laughs> i think we're feeling the heat so we need to be moving and there was two registration sheets that were being circled earlier Could somebody sort of say where they are oh there's a book there was also like a kind of clipboard oh, they're, they're up there perfect thank you there's there were so, there was so many people who all arrived later and we need to make sure that we catch up we're really interested to catch everybody who's who's attended tonight so if you if you did arrive late please or you uh, you haven't had a chance to to sign into one of those books or sheets if you could just make sure you do that before you leave that would be really appreciated there is a massive amount of food now <laughs> in the room just just behind us please make sure that before you leave you 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 enjoy some some of the catering that again has been provided very kindly by dsl thank you very much thank you thank you